persistence through better management and soil fertility. So I'll uh, let you go at it, Richard. You better go over time. Thanks, Jeffrey. I won't. I'm a bit nervous with this thing, though. Anyway, we'll see how we go. Um, look, before I start, I just wanted to thank um, Jeff, Martin, and the, and the team at RIV LLS uh, for putting on this event. Um, it's, there's not that many uh, venues or, or opportunities for pasture researchers to, to showcase you know, latest research. I look at guys like Rowan Brill over here, who, you know, who many of you know, and <clears throat> used to work for New South Wales DPI running great canola trials. And, and you know, people like Brilly really get these, this, this instant gratification. We get excited, we put a new trial in, and at the end of the year we harvest it, and there's the results. Unfortunately, you know, pasture research is a long-term game. And uh, you know, you've, you've got to have it in for three years before you start to learn something. You've got to push it out to five or six years to really get the most out of it. And, and by then, you know, the world's moved on and we're all working in different projects and, and farmers rarely get to see the results. So what I'm going to present today actually is um, the results of, of research which we started actually over 10 years ago. Um, but but it's, it's fitting that I present it now because actually the last paper has only just been written. You know, so we've, just, we've, we've now finished the work uh, and we've pulled it all together. So it's a good opportunity for me to actually uh, sort of, well, show you the highlights of it and, uh, and if there's anything else that comes from it or if any of you are interested in more detail, there's plenty of papers that sit behind it and you can follow up with me later and we can talk in more detail. But anyway, we'll get into it. How are we going to go here? <laughs> I'll get it, I'm sure I will. I'll look at that. Okay. All right, well, let's start with the definition of, of, of what's a cover crop because if you do what everyone does nowadays, <clears throat> when you've got a question, you just ask Google, what's a cover crop? Well, Google says that it's a crop grown for the protection or enrichment of soil. And so, so that's actually not, not the context that we tend to use it in, as, as a, in Australia. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the international literature, uh, what, what I'm really talking about is a companion crop. I'm, I'm talking about um, the simultaneous establishment of, of a pasture and a crop. So many of you do it. In the last year of your cropping phase, you'll put a, maybe a lighter rate of, of crop in, you'll put your pasture underneath it. And essentially what you're doing there is, is you're not growing the crop to protect the soil for the benefit of the pasture. You're trying to just get a little bit more off it uh, and, and reduce that time that pasture is sort of out of action, if you like, uh, and, and get the grain off it, then you've got the pasture to run with sort of early in the new year. Uh, so, so it's... It really is a companion crop, but I'm going to call it a cover crop. And we often use the word cover crop or under sowing interchangeably. OK, and, and of course, as you, as you normally, as you would know, you sow it in usually in autumn or early winter. You harvest the crop and, uh, and then the pasture's there, as I said. So just in terms of a bit of background and, and why we're interested in this, and, and actually why we, why we did a decade's worth of research on it in the first place. Um, when we look at the literature, uh, you know, there's, there's papers going back well over 80 years now um, of, of trials, pasture researchers, people like me in yesteryear, who have sort of done this small plot research and, and sort of concluded that, that pastures should not be established under a cover crop. Uh, and, and yet, a, a survey of farmers that we did early in our project work uh, revealed that more than 80% of, of people in the mixed farming zone establish their pastures under a crop. And you think, well, why, why is the research so clear and, and you know, people were saying don't do it, and yet so many people are, you know. So we wanted to understand um, that, that apparent mismatch. And, and, of course, you know, since a lot of that old research had been done, there'd been changes in the, in the farming system, in, in the machinery that we use, so it was time to revisit it anyway. Oh, gee, see what you mean, Lindsay. I'll get there. So, <clears throat> as part of our research, we had a large network of field experiments, which spanned quite a, quite a large area. We had trials up Condoblin, Bogan Gate, Cowra, quite a few around Area Park, Euron Creek, uh, and down towards Brocklesby. So we, we, we ran quite a number of field trials over quite a number of years. Um, and usually what I would have done in these presentations is 
gone through the results of the, of the field trials. But what that all led into was kind of an economic analysis. So I think we'll just jump to that first. Oops, if I press the right button. So, so we had uh, Tim Hutchings and, and Tom Norblum uh, do an economic analysis because ultimately that's, that's really what's going to drive you, isn't it? You know, it's, it's not what the pasture looks like, it's, it's how, it, how it stacks up financially. And I'm not going, not going to go through this too much other than to say there's people in the room that are probably interested in the details of the model and come and see me if you are or I can send it to you. But just to give you an idea, the type of financial analysis that we did was a, was a, a full financial analysis, so it wasn't just a, a partial budget. It took into account all costs and, and essentially how the model works, as many of these do, you put in your income, you put in all of your fixed costs, so that, that includes your living costs, that includes your tax, that's, that's all of your farm costs. And then you run this, what they call the Monte Carlo analysis. And the Monte Carlo analysis is simply just a combination of, of multiple years of taking historic rainfall, historic commodity prices, mixing them all up and seeing what range of results you can get over a, over a sequence of 10 years. So if you, and, and this is the beauty of a model. If you run field trials, you're pretty well limited to the conditions that you get in the years that you run the field trials. And I'll show you the effect of that, actually. When you do the modelling exercise with this Monte Carlo analysis, you can, you can guess. You can use the extremes using historical averages and you can get a range of likely results. And that's how you do your sensitivity. And that, that's actually how the economic analysis uh, was performed here. So in terms of the results, <clears throat> so, so what Tom and Tim did was they uh, were really testing are farm farmers financially better off if they're sowing a loosened pasture alone or sowing it under a, a cover crop, a cereal cover crop. And so here, this is just an example of some outputs we've got. Here they've, they've modelled, so we've got the cover crop in, it's under sown. Uh, they've run it at uh, 15 DSC, so they had, had a number of different stocking rates as well, which I won't go into. The point I wanted to make is, depending on which decade of year, so it was a, cum a cumulative average of decades, so it wasn't just one year in isolation, it was looking at a series of 10 years, and it can be any number of 10 years. So just depending on which decade they chose had a huge difference on the financial balance. So here we've got a, you know, quite a strong profit. Here we've sort of got a break-even kind of decade, and here we've got quite a loss. And then we compare that to the other scenario we were interested in, which is where Lucen was sown without a cover crop, it was direct sown, and you can see, you know, a strong profit, a break-even, or a loss. So the point I wanted to make about that was for the farmer you know, looking at this year on year with all of this seasonal variation, how on earth can you ever pick the difference between this graph and this graph because it's just masked by this massive variability? And that was, that was a big part of the problem that we've got. The, the success of cover cropping really is driven by the seasonal variability, which is not actually rocket science. So one of the things that the modellers do, and, and Lindsay actually uh, alerted to it in his talk, um, was you know, one way to compare productivity is to look at energy yield. So it's not just the biomass, it's the quality of the biomass as well. And, and, and we just uh, put that as, as energy. And so this is the figure that I'm going to give you. And that, to the untrained eye, looks like a dog's breakfast. But in actual fact, what that says is that year on year, there's quite a big difference and quite a lot of variability as to, to which is better, where you get the biggest uh, energy yield. Uh, and to save you counting, I can tell you that in 40 out of 60 years, uh, pastures uh, had a higher energy yield where they were sown alone without a cover crop. But the problem with that is it means that in one third of the years, so quite a substantial number of the, of the years, you were better off with the cover crop. So you kind of, it's not surprising that farmers who, who can't stand back and, and look at it, see this sort of year to year variation, you know, get a little bit confused as to, you know, are we really better off cover cropping or not? So to me, it doesn't make, it's not surprising to me that we've got this apparent, um, um, 
difference with, with the research recommendations and pharma practice. So, ultimately the question we need to ask is, when we're establishing pastures in the mixed farming zone, should we be using cover crops? And, and it's a bit of a soft answer, but it's actually a nuanced answer. It's not a yes or a no. Um, it's, there's reasons to do it, there's reasons not to do it, and it's more about you understanding when you should do it and when you shouldn't, and that's really what we're going to go through now. And, and of course, as you'd imagine, the success of establishing a pasture under a cover crop is going to depend on going to depend on things like seasonal conditions, even paddock conditions. Is it a more favourable paddock or is it a harder paddock? Paddock history, how weedy is it? Things like that. Uh, the enterprise mix, how important to your enterprise is livestock? How important is cropping? Um, the efficiency of utilisation, are you gonna, if you're going to grow more grass, are you going to be able to utilise it? Um, are you going to grow more grass or legumes or anything else? The target species that you want to use, uh, what you want to establish, I'll come to that in a second, as well as other objectives. You know, what are you growing the pasture for? Are you, are you growing the pasture to control weeds uh, or are you growing pasture to fix nitrogen? That can have an impact as well. Because at the end of the day, cover cropping really is a gamble. Um, you're, you're essentially looking to grow two crops at once and as you know, in many years, it can be a struggle to grow one. So it's about picking the times when you might decide to take that gamble. And ultimately, and you're going to hear a bit more about this later on today too, pasture establishment is a numbers game. So how do, how do you stack the numbers in your favour? All right, so here's, a, here's just a few examples of some uh, field experiments that we had. So this, this experiment was shown actually by a farmer uh, using his equipment, uh, and it was at Area Park in 2009. So it was a dry year. The growing season rainfall in that year was 235 millimetres. Uh, and the way we set these experiments up is we just said to the farmer, look, all right, tell me how you sow your cover crop. Uh, and, and what they would tend to do, if they, they would tend to sow their cover crop as a, at a half sowing rate. So if their standard sowing rate of wheat was 40 kilos, when they were sowing uh, or under sowing a pasture, they'd cut that back to 20. So what we did in our experiments, we'd get them to halve it again. So in this particular case, actually, uh, you can see the... The wheat sowing rate was 24, so his, his normal sowing rate was obviously 48, so he'd halved it, that's 24, got him to halve it again, that's 12. And then we had three pasture species, Lucerne, Phalaris or Chicory. And then what we did is we measured perennial plant density, so the establishment density. And really in that year what we sort of showed was that it didn't matter what we did there, it was only really the Lucerne that established well, the phalaris and the chicory really didn't establish well. So we were pushing the boundaries of those alternative species to start with. Um, and so, okay. So one of the conclusions of our research is that lucerne is probably the best pasture species to cover crop. If you are going to establish a pasture under a cover crop, lucerne's the most spe uh, suitable species. There's a few reasons for that. One, it's a, it's a summer growing uh, perennial, so it's got the opportunity to recover after harvest um, and continue to grow. So if you contrast that with something like subclover, subclover is going to set seed at about the same time that the crop's setting seed. So it's got no opportunity to recover once that crop's gone. Lucerne's got a big advantage. Lucerne's also a legume, obviously, so it can fix nitrogen, so it's in less direct competition uh, for nitrogen than the crop. Uh, and of course it's a pretty tough species, it's a pretty drought hardy species. So if you're going to cover crop, lucerne is probably the safest bet in terms of pasture species. Um, the other interesting finding from this research was just the effect of the cover crop on plant size. So if you look at the plant size, so this is just you know, grams per plant, of all of our species, in the absence of a cover crop, they're all substantially larger. So that's all that's really saying, and again, it's a little bit obvious, but where we've got pastures growing in competition with the crop, the crop's competing re for resources, and as a result of that, the plants are smaller. Now the problem with that, or the, the importance of that, is when you've got small plants and they're just coming into summer, it depends on the conditions that you get immediately after harvest as to how well they're going to survive. And so 
if you've got a loosened plant that's nice and big and robust, it can survive better if you don't get that rainfall than a little weedy spindly plant. So one of the reasons that cover cropping is a gamble is because of the competition effects you have on the pasture and their ability to recover after that crop has gone. What about in a wet year? So we went back to Area Park in 2010. Um, it had something like, a, well it had an annual rainfall that year of 800 and something millimetres, so it was a, a decile of eight, I think, or eight or nine rainfall year. We were actually on a different farm, um, so the sowing rates are slightly different, but similar sort of principle. Zero cover crop, 10 kilos or 20. Um, but what we did differently in this uh, experiment is we, we also altered the pasture sowing rate. So we have our Lucin and Phalaris at our standard sowing rate or our double sowing rate. So there's a few things I wanted to highlight in this particular table. Um, I've already highlighted them. The first thing was in a wet year, it didn't really matter. We didn't get that decline in establishment that we saw in the dry year. So again, rolling the dice, in a wet year, you can get away with a lot. Water forgives many sins. Um, and, and we were also able to get phalaris established as well. So we're in the dry year, we couldn't get the phalaris or the chicory established. In this wet year, we, we did get the phalaris established. So again, we got away with it. The other thing that I'd highlight, and I'll just use the top row as an example, where we doubled the sowing rate of the pasture, we, in, we didn't quite double, but we got close to doubling the density. So in other words, the density of the pasture was related to the density of the seeding rate. Okay? And Rowan Smith is going to talk a little bit more about the importance of seeding rates and sowing, but that just highlights the fact that sowing is a numbers game. Put less seed in, you'll get less plants. Okay. So that's the pasture side. What about the impacts of the crop? So firstly, we'll have a look at, at plant density in, in these experiments. So, so both the ones that I just described to you, 2009 and 2010. Um, so we had the nil, nil cover crop. Obviously, we ended up with nil plants. We had the quarter cover crop. So that was you know, 12 kilos or 10 kilos in the second graph. And then we had the, the, the standard cover crop rate, the 20 or the 24 kilos. And again, sowing's a number game. Where we put more seeds in, we get, ended up with more plants. That's a pretty simple message. So our crop density significantly incre increased with sowing rate, but we didn't observe in either year any differences in grain yield, uh, despite the lower plant density. So, that, so the crops were pretty good at, at compensating. So in 2009, in the dry year, we only got you know, grain yields of 0.6 to 1.1 tonnes per hectare. In 2010, we got 3.3 tonnes of the hectare. And we got good phalaris and loosened plants established. Go figure. When it rains, we can get away with a lot more. Uh, but we didn't uh, observe any difference in grain protein in most years. So one of the recommendations that comes out of this is if you're going to cover crop uh, with a cereal cover crop, we're, we're suggesting you go back to a quarter sowing rate. So if your standard sowing rate of wheat is 40 kilos, we're suggesting if you're going to under a pasture, stick it in at 10. All right, so then we went to the central west, Condo, Bogan Gate, Cowra, and we changed things a little bit. We were, we were interested in not just whether to cover crop or not, we were interested in a greater range of crop species. So in this particular experiment, you can see we've got lupins, we've got canola, uh, and we've also got wheat and barley. And we were also interested to see whether um, separating species in different drill rows uh, had an advantage. So if we, if we separated the pasture from the crop, was that a good thing to do? Would that help us manage that competition that we talked about before? Um, so this is, this is a busy graph. This is just looking at um, grain yields um, with, in separate drill rows. And when we summarise that, when we average across all of our species, we find that where the crop was sown in alternate rows with the pastures, so only sown in half the number of drill rows, these were on 10 inch row spacings, uh, on average we decreased grain yields by 24%. Uh, and we also didn't, didn't improve pasture persistence uh, either. So, so the message there is don't separate in different drill rows, it doesn't help. 
Crop choice, what about crops? So um, there's a number of things to consider when, we, when we're talking about crop choice. Uh, the first thing is competition with the pasture. Uh, how, how competitive are our relative crops with our different pastures? So here's a little graph here where we're looking at, uh, again, these are our central west sites, uh, average total pasture dry matter under the various crops. And you can see that the pasture dry matter tended to be uh, lower under our cereal crops uh, and highest under the lupin. So that kind of suggests to us a competitive effect. So there's probably more competition with the cereal crops and less competition with the lupins and with the canola. Um, other things to consider, you know, seed size is important. I know when we sowed those experiments, the experiments looked great, but the technicians hated them because they were a nightmare. As you imagine, we're trying to put the big lupin seed with the little pasture seed and trying to find a, you know, a sowing depth. Uh, there was certainly a lot, it was a lot more harmonious when we tried to put the canola in, you know, the canola seed and the pasture seed was a much more similar size, so that was helpful. Uh, but of course, herbicide tolerance um, was another, or herbicide options was another consideration. And the guys were a little bit worried about what we were going to do with broadleaf weeds in our canola and legume pastures, where we had canola and lucerne and subclover. So that's something that you have to consider as well. Uh, and then there's the likelihood of, of successful grain yield. So it's all right for me as a pasture scientist to stand up here and say, well, lupin's probably a good idea to sow as a, a cover crop because uh, it's less competitive with the pasture, but Remember, you're trying to grow two crops uh, in the same paddock in the same year. And so if you think that it might be a bit hard to get a lupin grain crop, sticking a pasture with it probably isn't going to help you. And, and, and so, you know, there's a reason why people have tended to stick with the cereals. They're a little bit more robust under harder seasonal conditions. Um, <clears throat> just an observation. One of the, probably as you look across the literature and as you look across all of our trial sites, you know, you get a lot of differences in results, uh, which are obviously driven by seasonal conditions, largely. But almost consistently, almost 100% of the time, cover crop leads to a more weedy pasture. And I'll just show you an example of that. So this is at Area Park, where we had no cover crop. We had 9% weed, and almost all of that weed actually was flea bone. Where we, where we had that quarter cover crop, you know, we had a third of the biomass was weed. Uh, and where we had the, the standard cover crop, that, that 20 kilo sowing rate, almost half of our biomass was weed. So one of the consistent effects I would say to you, and, and again, if you're sowing a pasture to fix nitrogen, or you know, you're sowing a pasture to control weeds, cover cropping's probably not gonna be a great idea because you're probably not gonna achieve your result. You will end up with a weedier pasture when you sow it under a cover crop. So just to summarise, as take home messages, um, as I said just then, pastures are almost always better when sown alone, uh, and particularly in terms of their weed content, but often because of biomass as well, but that does not guarantee better financial outcomes. Uh, sowing is a numbers game, so when you're sowing your, your cover, if you are going to sow a cover crop, you need to keep your pasture sowing rates up but use only a quarter of your, your crop sowing rate, okay? The best pastures to sow if you are going to cover crop is loosen. I think it's, it's very difficult to successfully establish things like subclover under a, a cover crop just because of the, the timing. The subclover's got no opportunity to recover um, after the crop's gone. Loosen does. Phalaris and chicory, uh, well, that's going to be your judgment on your environment. Obviously, it depends a bit on the summer rain and the conditions that you get. But I would say the more marginal your environment, the harder it's going to be to achieve a successful outcome. And we conclude that you need to, if you are sowing a mixture of species, you do need to sow all of your species in, in the same row. There is no benefit in, in um, reducing the number of drill rows that you'll sow these things to. Um, and if you do that, Basic principles, keep your drill rows as narrow as possible. So I, mean, so I guess the message is here is, you know, you go back home and you consider the context in your farm and what you want to achieve out of your pasture because ultimately it is a, a roll of the dice and you're taking the gamble. So, Geoffrey, I think I'll leave it there. Very good. Thanks, Richard.
Uh, so we're going to head into our Q&A session. We'll just grab three chairs up here and our mics. So we'll, um, we'll have two roving mics. If you could just raise your hand and grab our 